Welcome to our uh, third um, center center for uh, center for marketing analysis and forecasting um, Friday forecasting talk. Um, today we have Ivan Svetunkov. Um, he's going to talk about his new book, who new published book, um, forecasting with um, augmented um, the dynamic model. And the talk for today's session is the why we should care about exploratory smoothing. So we for our center provides uh, services. So we provide bespoke folks short courses, cross certainty, MSc project. Um, you can also contact us and we, uh, uh, if you have any uh, ideas for research or, or, or also consultancy, we also have a wide range of um, expertise in marketing analytics, demand forecasting, sales operations and planning, inventory management, machine learning and statistical learning. And if you want to um, keep in touch with us, you can have a look at our LinkedIn, our Twitter, or you can send us an email. We have also a website. And also we just uh, recorded a new video and we will the new video will be published anytime soon about um, educational video about forecasting. So keep an eye on that on YouTube. Please like and subscribe as well. So we also have this Friday for uh, forecasting talk. It will be a it, it it is a monthly event, um, usually in the middle of the month. So um, keep an eye on your link in and then yeah, just. Have a go with it. So I will stop my screen, mm -hmm. and then if you have any questions, then you can post something on the chat, um, and the floor is yours, Ivan. Great. So my name is Ivan Svetankov. I am a lecturer of marketing analytics at Management Science Department of Lancaster University, and I'm also a marketing director of the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And today we'll be talking about why you should care about exponential smoothing. Uh, the motivation is the following. Uh, exponential smoothing is actually one of the most popular methods in demand forecasting in practice. Uh, we've seen it personally when we conduct different types of um, consultancy for companies that it is very popular there and it actually fits the purpose, let's say. And also we had some uh, a survey, okay, it is a bit old, 2012, but in that survey, people reported that they use exponential smoothing very frequently. It's roughly 32% of the cases. Um, we actually now have a new survey, which is being conducted by Carlos Rodriguez Calderon, uh, a PhD student of the center. So we hope to get to collect more data and refresh the results of the survey in well next year roughly uh, but that's not all actually any major statistical software has exponential smoothing and relies on that and you might think that uh, maybe there is a conspiracy here that forecasters just uh, push their favorite child exponential smoothing but no actually there are some reasons why it is so popular however uh, Especially recently, I managed. I found that on LinkedIn, on social media, uh, some of machine le learning experts seem to have strong views about exponential smoothing and actually about forecasting. So I decided to put a couple of uh, citations here. One of those was uh, the main disadvantage of exponential smoothing is its inability to correctly factor in and handle market shifts and trends. Uh, that's actually not correct. Then there is exponential smoothing is just a special case of ARIMA. That's wrong as, again. Uh, exponential smoothing is the model from the black and white era TV. Also not correct. Applied forecasting academia hasn't created anything useful over the last 40 years. So you, you see that uh, there are some opinions and I thought that actually there's a lot of misconception about exponential smoothing and about forecasting and there is a misunderstanding around it. So I decided to make this presentation to clarify some things, to explain some things so that um, we all speak on the same language because I think that machine learning is great 
and uh, there's lots of useful things there but i also would like machine learning people to know forecasting better and it, it all it doesn't only apply to machine learning it also applies to other people who work in other areas uh, for example if you are an optimizer knowing a bit more about exponential smoothing hopefully will be useful uh, disclaimer so some of the models i discuss here uh, they are discussed in the monograph that kandrika mentioned this is the monograph i recently published uh, it's called forecasting and analytics with the augmented dynamic adaptive model the idea there is that uh, it is the mathematical model that builds on exponential smoothing uh, it introduces arima elements that merges them together and then becomes more and more complicated and this book is also provides R code. So if you want to try some things, you can see how they work. OK, so let's start. Uh, I typically have some sort of funny images. And one of them uh, to start with is basics of exponential smoothing. To the left, you see how you look in real life. And to the right, you see how you look after using exponential smoothing. So let's start a little bit with the history. Actually, a good overview of the past of exponential smoothing was given by Everett Gardner in 1985 and then in 2006. Uh, in this presentation, we will just discuss basics, uh, just the main exponential smoothing methods. But there's much more left uh, outside of this presentation. We start with the very basic thing, really coming from the 60s or even 50s. It's simple exponential smoothing. It is the method that was proposed by Brown in 1956 and actually independently proposed by Holt in 1957. But for whatever reason, the paper of Holt was not published, I think. So it was republished in 2004. The idea of the method is the following. We have actual value here. We have forecast from previous observation and we have a smoothing parameter alpha and alpha originally was thought to lie between zero and one and the meaning here is that if it equals to zero then this term disappears and we only use the predicted value if it is one then we neglect the predicted value and use only recent information actual observation in the forecast uh, by regulating alpha you can decide how much weight you put to one side or the other side and the important essential thing in exponential smoothing is that it uh, allocates non-equal weights to observations, to the actual observations. So it will put more weight to the most recent one and then smaller one on the previous one and so on and so forth. So that's a very simple mechanism that there is in simple exponential smoothing and uh, which made it probably the most attractive because it's very easy to interpret. In 1960, Muth showed that simple exponential smoothing has underlying ARIMA 011 model. This is a, an interesting point because it comes to that uh, original motivation that exponential smoothing is just a special case of ARIMA. Well, in this specific case, yeah, simple exponential smoothing can be considered as a special case of ARIMA with 011. Here, how it works on a real data. What we do, we just take a predicted value, we just take the actual, you know, mix them and produce one step ahead value, then mix the new values, predict one more, and so on. And we're moving through the data like this with some optimized smoothing parameter alpha. When it comes to the forecasting, the forecast is the boring straight line. So lots of practitioners actually uh don't like it because it produces a straight line and they want it to be a wiggly you know just following the noise but in forecasting we understand that there are time series that uh, are level time series in their nature and there's not much you can do with that it's just you know the average sales are changing slowly and you're just producing that for the next i don't know 12 observations you will have this average sales of your product and then you need to take care of all the uncertainty around this line using some sort of prediction interval if you think that this is suitable okay as you see it is indeed simple exponential smoothing so holt uh, in 1957 
um, sort of introduced a modification of this method. I present it here in the error correction form. This is not the conventional form uh, of Holtz method. And I think that uh, this one is probably a bit easier to understand. What do we have here? We have level component, which is originally captured, you know, by simple exponential smoothing. We have a trend component, and we are saying that our future forecast is just the combination of level and trend. When it comes to the update of the components, each one is updated using the following schemes. So next level is the previous level plus trend plus smoothing parameter times the error that the model did on the previous observation. And with trend, it's just previous trend plus smoothing parameter times the error on the previous observation. So it is relatively simple scheme, but it allows you to have the trend that now changes over time, not just the level of the time series. In 1964, Nerloff and Wage demonstrated that this has an underlying ARIMA 022 model, which is also we keep keep as a note for now. And here how it works. So we have some time series, and the purple line is the fitted value from Holtz method. And we can see how it follows the time series, and then it captures the last trajectory of going up, and it produces the increasing trajectory, the, the trend going up. So I would say that this is also a relatively simple method. Okay, it has additional components. Okay, this is represented as a set of equations, but the logic is straightforward from my perspective. Winters was a student of Holt, and in 1960, he developed a seasonal version of Holt's method that now contained an additional component, a seasonal component. So we take Holt's method from the previous slide and we add st, so st minus m plus one from, to produce one step ahead forecast. And what we do, we take this trend component, we multiply by seasonal index. And as the result, we have uh, seasonal dynamics here. Uh, in addition, so this becomes a bit more complicated, right? In addition to level and trend, we now have seasonal component and we need to divide the error by the seasonal element here. So it becomes a bit messy, but the logic is the same. All smoothing parameters have similar idea behind them. If they equal to zero, then we do not update the state. So then, for example, trend becomes just the previous trend. We, are, we will end up with deterministic trend. If it equals to one, then we end up with something very, very reactive. The model that changes its value on every observation substantially. Right, so that's Winters, Holt Winters. This is called Holt Winters uh, method. And actually in 1977, Chatfield showed that there is no underlying ARIMA for the multiplicative seasonal Holt Winters method, this one. So we see already some discrepancies. So there, there, there are some methods in exponential smoothing family that are substantially different from ARIMA because there is no such thing as Arima underlying this method. How does it work? Here is an example. We have a series with some increase and we have some seasonality, seasonal pattern. You know, every January we see roughly slight decline in comparison with December. And this pattern is repeated from one year to another. And we get the final forecast, which uh, captures the trend, captures the seasonality. Okay, in this case, forecast may be not, not very accurate because we are overshooting the actual values. Cool. So we see that some exponential models have underlying ARIMA, and, but not all of them. So this led uh, statisticians to think that uh, ETS in, is inferior to ARIMA. That it is just uh, a special case of ARIMA, because if you have a bigger model, then surely if it can uh, have a special case, it can model this type of time series. Well, in 1982, Makrodakis et al. conducted an independent experiment. What they did, they collected 1001 time series. They invited lots of people to participate and submit um, their forecasts. Uh, there were several people who worked on Box Jenkins methodology. 
If you not, um, if you do not know Box Jenkins methodology, have a look either at their book or at the Adam monograph I mentioned. Roughly, the idea is that you need to look at time series, you need to analyze autocorrelation functions, then make decision about a specific order to include, then analyze residuals of that model and so on. So this is an iterative procedure, which was considered back then as the state of the art for ARIMA. So people used that and the results of that experiment were that exponential smoothing and something called ARARMA performed much better than uh, ARIMA with Box Jenkins methodology. ARARMA is a weird beast, but what it does actually, it uses information criteria to select AR and MA orders. So it is a, a curious model uh, and it did very well in the very first competition. Uh, statistical community did not like the results and you can ask Robert Files, uh, Spiros Makredakis and some other people who took part in the original competition. They will tell you all the stories about that, when, how they tried to publish the results in statistical journals and those results were rejected uh, on the grounds that uh, this cannot be true. So things like that. Okay. Uh, what next? Well, next, Roberts in 1982 proposed a model which was then picked up by Gardner and McKinsey and expanded the set of exponential smoothing methods. It was called damped trend exponential smoothing. The idea is we take Holtz method, we add a dampening parameter phi, which lies between zero and one, and we multiply that parameter by the trend so that our trend is not straight anymore. It starts slowing down depending on the value of phi. This method has an underlying ARIMA 112. And then in 1982, Gardner and McKinsey also came up with the seasonal counterpart of that. And since then, there were some studies that showed that this method is actually quite robust. So it does quite well in many contexts. Okay, that's how it looks. The same date as before. Holtz method produced straight line. This one is declining, as you can see. And it makes sense because we wouldn't expect the, uh, the increase, the, the linear increase all the time. At some point, you know, the data will probably uh, stabilize even if you have a trend, originally had a trend in the data. So this sort of trajectory make, makes much more sense than just the straight one. On this data, we overshoot, but look at the final uh, observations, the method managed to capture the tendency so it goes like this. The, the catch here is that the, in the holdout sample, the situation has changed substantially. So we now we have plateau the level here, which neither hold nor dem trend can actually predict very well. well. And if you just hide this part of the data, you would think that you know we should have the increasing trend. Okay, now the series, and the important uh, contribution to, to the field was paper by Ralph Snyder in 1985. So in parallel uh, to exponential smoothing, there was development of a model called multiple source of error model. It's a state space model, which uses typically Kalman filter to estimate parameters. And Snyder developed a modification of MSOE, which was called single source of error. And mathematically, it's represented like this. I'm not going to spend much time discussing the things here. Uh, it's just a combination of several matrices. And when you insert in this vector, state vector, uh, the components of level, trend, seasonal, you end up with uh, pure additive exponential smoothing methods, models. And But this is, as I say, this was a breakthrough because this becomes a proper statistical model, something that all the previous developments were missing. Now, all the components here are influenced by the same error, epsilon t. In MSOE, that's not the case. In MSOE, it's considered that the, the first equation, measurement equation, has its own randomness. And then when it comes to states, states evolve independently with their own errors. Uh, this thing is much easier to understand and estimate than mul multiple source of error. That's why it became popular after this paper, or after some years. And here is an example. 
if we set w equal to 1, f equal to 1, and g equal to alpha, let's have a look back. This is 1, this is 1, this is alpha, and instead of vt, we get uh, insert level. We end up with uh, so-called local level model that underlies simple exponential smoothing. Uh, this is just an example, you know, to show how uh, SSOE state space model aligns with exponential smoothing. Now we are around the year 2000, M3 competition organized by Makrodakis, Spiris Makrodakis and Michel Ibo. Uh, and they published a paper in 2000. The logic was the same as in the original M1 competition. Now they had 3003 time series. They invited people to participate and uh, automatic arima that used box jenkins principles performed worse than the damp trend on the data that data uh, which also tells you that something wasn't right about the the automatic selection in arima ssoe model did not participate it was not uh, ready back then but in general exponential smoothing methods did well but they did not win the competition what won the competition was the theta method developed by Kostas Nikolopoulos and uh, I, I think it was Basilius Asimakopoulos uh, the interesting thing is that theta method being quite robust and accurate in many contexts which we now know since 2000, relies on the mechanism of simple exponential smoothing in it. So you can see that the influence of exponential smoothing is big, that even some new method, that, which was quite innovative back then, still used uh, that principle. Now, in 1997, so it's a bit earlier, uh, Ort et al., Keith Ort, uh, Ralph Snyder, Ann Koehler, I think maybe I missed someone. Uh, they expanded the single source of error for the cases of multiplicative components and multiplicative error. So the thing that we've seen on one of the previous slides now was transformed into a set of functions. And now depending on the value of the function, you end up with uh, additive or multiplicative component. And this thing now underlies every single exponential smoothing method that we have. Heinemann et al expanded uh, building upon Pegel's taxonomy from 1969, they expanded uh, the SSOE framework and proposed a taxonomy, which was then modified in their uh, seminal book, uh, Exponential Smoothing, the State Space Approach, 2008, and they called the framework ETS, Error Trend Seasonality. Uh, so this model, this framework, is relatively easy to use and estimate. We have several R functions that implement it. It provides appropriate prediction intervals and supports model selection. When I say appropriate, I mean that you can easily uh, generate them from the model. Uh, it has model selection. What I mean is that we have so many models inside the framework that you need to select the most appropriate for your data, so it is supported by the framework. And overall, it has 30 models underlying 15 exponential smoothing methods. These include uh, multiplicative trend by Pegels and uh, the modified version with DEM trend by uh, James Taylor. The good thing about this framework, it can be extended further. You can include explanatory variables there. You can add seasonal components or anything else. So it is a uh, as uh, Kandrico at some point phrased, it is like a Lego. You know, you, you can actually add new blocks and make it uh, much more flexible, depending on, on the needs that you have. And here is a figure with different time series corresponding to different ETS models. How do we read this? ETS, A and N. So A stands for the error. Uh, the second element stands for the trend. The third one stands for the seasonality. This is the additive error, no trend, no seasonality. If we pick something random, for example, this ETS AADA, so it's additive trend, no, additive error, additive damp trend, and additive seasonality. So you have the whole zoo of things here. 
and they, uh, as you can see, underlie lots of different time series. So we arrive at 2008, and we arrive to the next question that I have. Why is exponential smoothing attractive? Okay, so the, now we come, we jump to 2022 to the paper of Spavound and Carenzis. They discuss actually four factors impacting the trustworthiness of forecasting methods. Here they are. First is reliability. Uh, give me a second. I wanted to do something. Okay. First is reliability. Then it, what it means is whether the method performs consistently across time series. Then there is stability. So does the method perform consistently across time, across observations? Intelligibility. Uh, this comes to explainability of key elements of the forecasting approach. And alignment, which is whether your approach aligns with the objective that we have in practice. And they argue in their paper that if uh, the approach ticks all the boxes, then this becomes a trustworthy approach. If it doesn't tick one of the bo boxes, then in practice, people tend to trust it less. And this might cause issues because at some point people would start switching to different approaches instead of the one that you would want them to use. Also, there was a presentation by Simon. Uh, we can share the link in the chat. Uh, the presentation about the, this exactly this uh, thing in one of our webinars, one of the pre previous webinars. Okay, um, let's have a look. Reliability. Well, actually, we know that exponential smoothing has performed quite well in many competitions. Uh, that's M competition, uh, some additional by Robert Files, another M competition, tourism competition by George Thanasopoulos, and then there is uh, M4 competition. There was also M5 where it did fine, but not well. Actually, we'll come back to that point. Sorry, no spoiler alerts. <laughs> now it doesn't necessarily come first. And that's an, an important thing to keep in mind. You shouldn't expect exponential smoothing to be universally great everywhere. You shouldn't expect this from any model, actually. Mm, but in general, exponential smoothing is very hard to break because it's quite simple. It has just, you know, up to three equations. And uh, yeah, you change the parameters, you make it uh, more reactive or less reactive. But in general, it does, it's very difficult to overfit the data. And as a result, the forecasts from it are fine. They might not be stellar, but they are fine. Interesting thing is Makredakis showed, uh, et al. Makredakis et al. showed, uh, based on M5 competition, that 92.5% in, that of submissions that they had in the competition failed to outperform the bottom-up exponential smoothing. So there were lots of people who attended, who participated in the competition, and 92.5% of them failed to outperform this quite simple forecasting model, forecasting method. Stefan Colassa took this even further. The, the year is incorrect here, it should be 2022. He showed that the winner of M5 competition outperformed this bottom-up exponential smoothing on 58.5% of series in terms of mean squared error. So there's a huge chunk of time series which uh, forecast better by exponential smoothing rather than by machine learning method that the winner used. The second place outperformed it only on 6.7% of series, uh, which is also an interesting observation. So this means that this method is indeed quite robust once again, it doesn't win. It probably failed miserably in 6.7% of series, but it did a good job in on the rest. So these are examples of reliability. Uh, it is a robust forecasting model, which is difficult to break. What about stability? In exponential smoothing, stability comes from the smoothing parameters. So if the parameters are low, then your forecasts from one origin to another are stable. If they are too high, then the forecast becomes unstable, it changes abrupt, abruptly, and so on. So Kandra Caprito Larga, together with Nico Sandai, showed how re regularization can help uh, ETS. 
And so we used lasso and uh, ridge regression to shrink smoothing parameters. And to the left here, you can see an example from the paper where smoothing parameter equals to 0 0.47. And you can see how the forecasts from one origin to another are changing and how the, the method itself behaves here or the model itself. Uh, the, the orange origin is the very first one and the yellow is the very last one. And there is a bit of variability here, but when you smooth, uh, not smooth, sorry, when you regularize smoothing parameter uh, using shrinkage, the best, uh, best value is 0 0.19 and the thing becomes much less reactive and the forecasts agree more from one observation to another. Now, this is actually important in practice because when you want to make decisions how many items you want to stock for the next week or something like that, you don't want your forecasting model to tell you on Monday that you need to stock 100 and on Tuesday that you need to stock 50 units. You want it to be more or less stable and uh, that it wouldn't change its mind from one observation to another. Otherwise, you will have issues when deciding how many units you need to order. So as we see, it checks the box for uh, stability when you uh, treat uh, smoothing parameters correctly. Actually, forecasters have known <laughs> for quite a while that smoothing parameters should be lower, as low as possible. It's just we formulated it in this um, approach using regularization, so automating this process. Now, intelligibility. Intelligibility is whether we can explain the main key elements of the model. Uh, the, the issue in practice is that lots of demand planners do not know forecasting. There's lots of people who work in industry. They decide how many units uh, we need to order or how many units, how, what demand we will have in the next period, but they don't have forecasting training. They are great experts in their you know, subject field, they know the product very well, but they might not know the basics of forecasting. And a lot of them don't even know statistics, which is also an issue. So when you come to them and you ex explain them, for example, Sarima 112010 with seasonality of four, which is this model here, this blows their minds typically. And if they don't understand the thing, they don't understand what's happening, they tend not to use the model. Even if uh, Sarima is actually good for their own case, uh, for their situation. So this is difficult to explain. Cons compare it with the simple exponential smoothing. Whenever we teach, when, whenever we provide executive training to companies, we <laughs> see that people uh, understand this scheme of simple exponential smoothing very fast. It's not uh, rocket science. So it is easy to explain the exponential smoothing. The more complicated models, okay, they become <laughs> more difficult to explain. For example, hot winters, or if we, even in, if we move to state space, ETS, uh, whatever the combination of letters, that becomes a bit more challenging to explain, but still it is easier than ARIMA. We've tried <laughs> actually, and we can tell you uh, from our experience. Now, the related thing is intelligibility, and this comes to the decomposition that is uh, obtained automatically when you use exponential smoothing. So we have this data, we apply the model, and we get automatically level, trend, seasonal, and the error term. And this split into different components is relatively straightforward and relatively easy to understand for practitioners, because then they can, can see what happened with the seasonal, they can see what is happening in the era and so on, and they understand how these things contribute to the final model, final forecast from the model. So we tick box here. Now the element of alignment is a different beast altogether. This can be done in ETS framework. How do we align this forecast with decisions? We can produce cumulative over the lead time forecasts, for example, if we are interested in understanding how many units we need to stock over the lead time. We can generate prediction intervals or specific quantiles depending on specific needs of companies. And this is discussed in some detail in 
are the monograph in chapter 18 with different options for point forecasts, quantiles, and different types of prediction intervals that uh, exist in forecasting and people can use. So there is this thing. And plus, you can actually use loss functions to estimate ETS that align better with decisions. Uh, here I refer to several papers, uh, Karenz et al, Saud et al, and then there is recently published uh, from my PhD. Uh, so some of these papers show that if you are interested in inventory management, then you shouldn't estimate model using, for example, least squares or likelihood. You can instead use so-called trace forecast and or in, produce cumulative uh, over the late time forecasts and optimize on them directly then your uh, final forecast forecasts align much better with decisions so you see it, it can be done and the modern literature tells you how things can be aligned so from my perspective it looks like ets uh, ets or exponential smoothing ticks all four boxes without much trouble without without much of a hustle uh, but we did not expect it to perform always great as i said it, it is Horses for courses, you know, depending on your situation, maybe one model will work better than the other. Now I refer to Nixla. Uh, this is a company that implements open source um, open source functions in Python. They implemented ETS in their library and it works fine, but it does not always outperform machine learning methods. But also, why would it outperform machine learning methods? You spend much more time working on machine learning, getting information across time series and so on. So you expect them to perform well. And here is a table from uh, a paper published by Nixla. It has uh, several flavors of machine learning. It has ETS here, uh, Theta. It doesn't have Arima for whatever reason, unfortunately. And what we can see, okay, ETS did not uh, outperform uh, other models here or here or here or here, but they didn't also fail uh, miserably as some of the other models here. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find the source of this uh, error measures and I didn't have time to ask Nixler guys to provide me the source. Uh, so I cannot see, for example, in how many cases ETS fails or in how many cases it, it actually still works. And also it wasn't possible to see how much computational time we spent on ETS with comparison in comparison with complex exponential smoothing LGBM and time GPT, for example. So the only thing I could find was the paper, recent paper of Makredakis et al, where they looked at a variety of machine learning methods versus ETS, ARIMA, and ensemble of statistical models. You can see that ETS is not uh, outperforming all the others on average. Right? but it is at the lower side of the spectrum. This is logarithmic computational time. So here to apply this to the data set that they used, it takes roughly 15 minutes. Ensemble of uh, deep learning models that did the best, it actually outperformed everything substantially, it takes 20 days to train. So for me, this is a question of you know trade-off. What do you want? You want to have a fast result? Here it is, it is fast and... Uh, cheap or if you want to improve your accuracy you need to move to machine learning and spend more resources to to get better results right so uh <laughs> for the last five minutes i'll go briefly through several examples how conventional model uh, ets can be improved because the original was developed for regular demand but we also can have explanatory variables intermittent demand and or multiple frequency these are all discussed in the other monograph. So how can it be improved? ETSX with explanatory variables was mentioned in chapter nine of Heinemann et al textbook. And I've just jumped to that resource, sorry. It was then used by Kohler et al in 2012. And then uh, Karenzis Petropoulos and Ramos et, uh, Ramos et al showed that uh, ETSX actually outperformed the one without explanatory variables. So it can be used, and in their cases, it uses uh, it works fine. It didn't work fine for Abel Kasemi et al. paper. It uh, did a poor job there. I don't know why. In M5 competition, ETSX outperforms the 
basic one. So that's another finding. And this thing is implemented in uh, Adam function for the smooth package in R. And there is discussion in the chapter of uh, the monograph. So when we use, I used, decided to use an example of ETSX, a multiplicative error, no trend multiplicative seasonality with dummies for promotional activities for outliers and lags. There's a bit of a R code, which is unimportant. We get the following. Uh, okay, it captured the weekly seasonal pattern. Fine. It took care of uh, outliers. These are for because of promotions. Okay. So if we were expecting promotions in the future period, we could reintroduce them, and then we would have uh, respective forecasts. This is just a demonstration. So another case, another demonstration of the thing that works is intermittent demand. And this comes to the recently published paper by John Boylan and I. We proposed this back in 2017. So it was a long road. But what we did there, we proposed an intermittent state space model, which relies on this simple equation. You have actual demand, you have binary variable with zeros and ones, and we have demand sizes. Demand sizes are modeled using ETS. The binary variable is a bit tricky. I'm not showing all the mathematics here. The point here is that this model extends ETS taxonomy. It allows capturing trends and seasonality on intermittent demand. And you can also introduce explanatory variables for both demand sizes and demand occurrence. So if you have intermittent demand with some promotional activities or something like that, you can model them, that thing using uh, the model that we proposed. Once again, there is a function and there is a chapter in the book. Uh, in R, uh, an example on some data, this is data from M5 competition. And here how the IETS works. You can see the purple line is the fitted values and you can see the blue line is the point forecast. And yeah, it doesn't get, do very, very well at the end, but I actually produce cumulative uh, forecast for this period. So it's more interesting to see Overall, when we use this um, upper bound from the uh, function, whether it covers the cumulative demand over the period of time or not. And that's the figure I produced. So this is the red line, the safety stock recommended by IETS. The black line is the cumulative sales over the whole period and the blue line is just working stock. So just as an example for this specific time series, this specific situation, the safety stock is higher than the demand. So we are safe, let's say. We still have more products to sell than uh, people came to buy. And the last thing is the multiple seasonalities. So this was developed originally by James Taylor in uh, his paper in 2010. He proposed triple seasonal hold winters and then double seasonal one. And this was then ex extended in uh, the next paper by Taylor and Snyder. Then De La Vera uh, proposed Alicia Butts model and then a T Butts. Now the thing with T Butts, it's a long, big model with lots of um, whistles. <laughs> it's a trigonometric box Cox transform Arma arrows trend and seasonal components model. So it's a big cocktail of things, but it is good for high frequency data. Uh, but is a generalization of ETS without E. So they use box Cox transformation of data. They don't need additive or multiplicative model. It relies on the trend and seasonal components from exponential smoothing. And it solves the problem of fractional seasonality by Fourier transform. And it has been shown that this approach works quite well on daily data, in some cases on hourly data as well. Uh, there's no point in using TBATS on monthly data because you end up with just uh, one of the modifications of ETS model. Uh, Adam supports multiple seasonalities in, in the style of James Taylor. Uh, it supports all ETS models. Taylor only discussed additive ones and it can work very fast. So it doesn't implement TBATS, it implements just multiple seasonal model. But for example, this thing, what is this? Uh, multiplicative error, multiplicative seasonality, no trend, two seasonal uh, frequencies, 48 and 336 plus AR1 uh, element. This can be all done in one function. And we use a, an initialization of uh, backcasting. This takes approximately two seconds to evaluate, evaluate on 3,700 observations. You can add more things there if you want, like Fourier terms to get closer to TBATS. But in two seconds, you get this. 
So this high frequency data, it fit it well and the point forecast uh, captured the pattern well. Is it great? Is it performing stellar and better than all the other possible approaches? Probably not, but you get this relatively fast uh, and I don't see why not, why not do that. Right, so I'm coming to conclusions. Uh, the conclusions are the following. Exponential smoothing has not been a model from the black and white TV era for a long time now. Yes, it was originally proposed in 1956, but there's been lots of development since then. It uh, has seen, we have seen huge progress in this area for the last 40 years with all the modifications starting from uh, Everett Gardner, ending uh, Rob Heinemann and his team, and then uh, Lancaster team that also worked on that. It is not a special case of ARIMA. ARIMA only works with sort of pure additive models. You can take logarithms and you have ARIMA and logarithms, but ETS goes beyond that. In fact, in fact, you can actually make work ARIMA and ETS together. That's something I also mentioned in the monograph. Uh, ETS handles external information via explanatory variables, ETSX, and it can deal with intermittent data and or multiple frequencies in the data. Uh, the ADAM that I've developed presents a modern view on ETS and ARIMA. Now, if you see something like this on slides of other people or in papers, <laughs> you should run away because this is a very old school, old representation of exponential smoothing. And this means that people have missed literature since 2000. So they missed the whole uh, chunk of literature for the last 23 years. So if you see this, don't trust these people because this means that they don't know the state of the art in forecasting. You should use state space exponential smoothing, so aka ETS. This is the modern formulation that you use uh, with the error term everywhere, single source of error. If you use the old formulation, then you are stuck in 50s and 60s. So get unstuck and use modern exponential smoothing. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask. I'll stop sharing my screen. Yeah, thank you, Ifan, for very nice um, wrap up, I would say, about exponential smoothing from 1960s until 2024. So it's very <laughs> nice. So there's a question from Yunus. Um, inventory forecasting, a question related to inventory forecasting. It's better to have safe stock, no doubt, but it comes with price. We occupy space, is it an issue at all? I mean, offer forecasting, and if yes, how we address it. So uh, how we address offer forecasting in inventory problem. In the main, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I think there are two things here. One is the safety stock, uh, which we probably need anyway, if we don't want to have empty shelves. So you want to have uh, some safety stock uh, just to cover the demand while you're waiting for the delivery of, of new batch of products, new SKUs. So in this case, inevitably, we want to have something. Yes, it occupies shelves, but then it comes to costs of having uh, empty shelves versus costs of having full shelves. And there is a trade-off there, maybe depending on the specific context, you would go in one direction or the other. Uh, as for the over-forecasting, um, in general, we want our forecasts to be unbiased and we don't want to produce uh, higher forecasts than needed. So we need to track that. And one way of tracking that is calculating error measures. And for example, you can calculate bias to see uh, how your models perform. I hope that answers the question. So basically, um, just to make it clear, so basically we can use the error measure to select which model that produce forecast they are not over forecast and under forecast is that what you mean right yes yes and uh, this comes to measuring bias so for example mm. mean error uh, or some modifications of mean error would do that and okay. actually there is also uh, research showing that bias is more related to inventory performance than accuracy so you might have very accurate forecasts that doesn't mean that you will do well well in terms of inventory but when you have biased forecasts, then most probably you won't do well. Okay, so there's another question from Mark up at Roland. 
Um, what would it be the best practice to deal with very intermittent data? There are not clear seasonal pattern and very inconsistent volume. Yes, that's a good question. And in intermittent data is one of the most challenging um, topics, I, I must say. My general recommendation, if you can avoid it, avoid it. Uh, so, for example, if you can, if you have intermittent data on daily level, but you make decisions on weekly level, don't make your life too complicated. Aggregate it to weekly, maybe intermittents, uh, intermittents will disappear and you will be able to make decisions. This will make your life much easier. Uh, yeah, if you do months and it's intermittent, then there's not much you can do, unfortunately. You have to use some of the methods, but on monthly data, maybe uh, you wouldn't see seasonality on its own, depending on the type of product. Let's say if, you, if you're selling uh, engines, then there's no seasonality there. All you need to do is understand what decisions you make based on the forecasts and then align those forecasts with decisions. I know it sounds a bit general, but it comes to every specific situation. So for example, you, you need to um, decide how many engines you will sell in the next half a year. Uh, well, then you produce your forecasts and then you see what would be the, the safety stock, the, the quantile, specific quantile uh, from your model that will give you the idea of how much you need to have. So it, it, yeah, another thing related to that is a specific point forecast accuracy on intermittent demand is not very important. It's very difficult to, to beat things like, uh, I don't know, TSB or something like that. The, the differences are very small. But then again, if you manage to beat it, does it mean that you're doing very good in terms of inventory? Does it matter for your decision? And in many contexts that we, we see, the answer is no. It's not really important how you perform in terms of point forecasts on intermittent demand. It's more important uh, what uncertainty you are able to capture. Okay, so good questions. Um, I actually have a question, Ivan. So mm -hmm. basically you develop a lot of, um, a lot of the extension of ETH exponential smoothing, but it comes with the complexity of the ETS itself. Yeah. So you, you increase the complexity. So have you noticed any um, cost of having more complexity? And then, yeah, and maybe you mm -hmm. can, we can mitigate that basically. That's a very good question. Um, if you have ETS with explanatory variables with multiple frequencies, you might end up with a model that has lots of parameters to estimate. Um, in some settings, if you're not very smart, you might end up with thousands of parameters. And that's not hmm, easy. That's not an, an easy task. Um, given that ETS in the things, in different implementations, different packages and libraries is typically, typically optimized using uh, approaches like nailed or mid, um, you end up with a very complicated task where Neldar Mead might not be able to find the optimum. So you will end up with a suboptimal, not very good model. This means that you need to be smart when you estimate that model. So complexity increases. And one of the things that I see becomes prominent is the estimation. And you need to use some other techniques for estimation or maybe some other optimizers. That's one thing. And the other thing, inevitably, the more parameters you have, the fewer degrees of freedom you have. So maybe you will end up with high uncertainty and you, you, the model becomes much more erratic, I would say, than in the simpler case. Yeah. Okay, good. Um... Do we have any question more? I don't think so. Okay, one more last, uh, one last question for me. So how would you see exponential smoothing in the future? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I think one of the uh, examples of uh, usefulness of exponential smoothing in the future was uh, the paper by Slavik Smil for M4 competition. So what he did, he used machine learning. I think it was deep neural network together with uh, exponential smoothing. And 
he won the competition and did better than all the others. I think the sort of combination of exponential smoothing of ETS model, classical statistical things together with machine learning is one of the potential ways forward. But even if it's not the potential way forward, then having ETS as a benchmark uh, is, is a good idea. You can always just apply it and see how it performed on your data and compare it with much better or more accurate models, machine learning models. Okay. One last question here. It's very good one. Using um, profit has become in a fashion industry. How does a down fare in comparison with profit? Yes, it is indeed a good question. I would say it depends on the context because profit was developed, if I remember correctly, for specifically for weekly time series. Uh, there are different studies showing that profit is not doing good uh, on, on different time series. For example, M3 competition, there was a post by Nikos Koranzas who compared different approaches, classical statistical ones with profit and he showed that actually they're doing better. Um, we did together with uh, Jethro Browell and Bachman Rastam and Tabar, we wrote a paper on A and D hourly data forecasting and profit didn't perform well. Adam actually outperformed it, but Adam was a quite advanced model. It had uh, hourly frequency, it had um, day of week frequency, it also had sort of week of year frequency and it had, spe had special events and intermittent uh, elements to it. So it was a big stuff and yeah, it performed much better. But also okay. Adam is not a panacea because for example, um, generalized additive model for location, scale, and shape in the same experiment performed even better. Okay, good. I think the, the main point here is that um, every problem has different solution dif and we, we might have a different model, different situation as well. I think it always depend, it always depends on this decision, what we are supporting. Right. So whether we we could have not accurate forecast, but at least it's good. Um, it's good enough to support the decision. And then yeah. So the slides will be shared. Um, just keep in uh yeah. Uh, keep an eye on our link in. There will be a video published in the YouTube as well. So I think we we are about the time to finish. Um, thank you everyone. Just in time. Yes. Thank you everyone for uh, joining our webinar and see you next month in January. Happy Thank holiday, Merry Christmas and New Year. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. See you all. See you all.